Hello everyone, I hope you all are having a good day so far. I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the Battle of Cowpens. Now, the Battle of Cowpens is one of my favorite battles of the Revolutionary War to read about, as it is two of my favorite characters, well, not really favorite, but most interesting characters to read about from the American Revolutionary War. It's got Daniel Morgan, who is probably my, fa my second favorite American commander of the war, second to Nathaniel Green, and it's got Bannister Tarleton, one of my... One of the most interesting British soldiers to read about and to see them to clash. This was actually, I believe, the second time that they clashed. Um, they had a very brief engagement during Saratoga, although it's unconfirmed whether or not Daniel Morgan was a part of the sharpshooters that Tarleton attacked with the 17th Light Dragoons, but this was their first formal on-the-field, open-field battle clash. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read to you a passage from the book The Green Dragoon, The Lives of Banners to Tarleton and Mary Robinson, which was written by Robert Bass, I believe in 1971 or 1972 is when it was written. And I'm reading the Cowpens chapter, and I want to get your all's thoughts, opinions on this as to, you know, how both sides looked at this, how Robert Bass takes the historical record, personal diaries, and of course the personal journals and diary entries from Bannister Tarleton, Cornwallis, and some of the British and American commanders from that day. So without further ado, here we go. As Morgan retreated from Pacolet on January 16th, Tarleton doubled his efforts. But Charlie's and spies were immediately dispatched to observe the Americans, he said in the campaigns, which the campaigns was a book he wrote in 1785, and then he revised it and re-released it in 1787 with a few adjustments, but it was about basically the British Southern Campaign and his actions. So when I refer to the campaigns, that's what I'm referring to. The dragoons were directed to follow the enemy till dark, and the other emissaries to continue their inquiries till morning, if some military incident did not occur. Early in the night, the patrols reported that General Morgan had struck into byways, tending towards Thicklick Creek. The Loyalist militia captured a colonel who had been sh straggled from the American militia and brought him before Tarleton. The examination of the militia colonel and other accounts soon after were received, Invinced the propriety of hanging upon General Morgan's rear, to impede the junction of reinforcements said to be approaching, and likewise to prevent his passing Broad River without the knowledge of the light troops, who could perplex his design and call in the assistance of the main army if necessarily required. The British had little sleep that night. By two o'clock, the buglers were sounding revelry. By three o'clock, the troops were ready to march. Calling in his pickets and telling his wagoners to follow after daybreak, Tarleton set out on the road to Thickletty Creek. In his van marched the light infantry supported by the Legion Infantry, the British Legion. In the center came the 7th Regiment, then the Artillery, and then the 71st Regiment under MacArthur. Tarleton brought up the rear with his green horse. The march was slow and tedious, for the night was dark and the road rough. About an hour before dawn, they reached Thick Eddy Creek, and from there Tarleton sent forward a cavalry patrol. Soon these horsemen clashed with an American patrol under Captain Inman. Learning that Morgan was encamped only five miles in front, Tarleton ordered Captain Oglevy to reinforce the advance car with two troops of dragoons, then to move up and get harassing the Americans. When Captain Inman, having escaped in a running fight with the Green Horseman, dashed in with the alarm over Tarleton's night march, Daniel Morgan was surprised. He had not expected an attack at dawn, that it was too late to retreat. The British would cut his rear to pieces if he attempted to ford Broad River. Morgan called in everyone who could give him personal observation of the tactics of the Green Dragoon. He asked Colonel Wynn, who had commanded Sumter's Reserve at Blackstock's. Can you inform me of the manner Colonel Tarleton brings on his attacks? I can. Tarleton never brings on the attack himself. His mode is fighting is surprise. By doing this, he sends two or three troops of horse, and if he can throw the party in confusion with his reserve, he falls on and cuts them to pieces. Turning from when, the veteran with the inflamed sciatic nerve pointed to the wooden eminence known as the cowpens. On this ground, he said, I will defeat the British or lay my bones. The country around Morgan was exceedingly hilly and rough. Before him ran a red clay by road. Behind him, for 350 yards, the terrain rose towards a ridge, a slope of open wood and oak and chestnut, where once a loyalist named Saunders penned his cows from the range. 
For 80 yards behind this crest, the ground dropped into a swell. Then, from a smaller ridge, the country leveled into a plain stretching towards Broad River. To the east stood Thickety Mountain, and in the distant west loomed the Blue Ridge Mountains. Across the crown of the ridge at Cowpens, among the oaks and chestnuts, in a line about a quarter of a mile long, Morgan deployed his seasoned troops. To his left, he pointed, he posted light infantry commanded by Lieutenant Colonel John Eager Howard, a splendid contingent of some 290 Continentals. In line on his right, Morgan posted triplets and Tate's Virginia Militia and Bill's Georgians. These men were mostly veterans who had rejoined his volunteers after serving their enlistments in the Continentals. The command of this line, consisting altogether of 450 troops, he also entrusted to Howard. About 150 yards down the slope, in a thin line masking the main body, Morgan deployed 300 Carolina militia under Colonel Andrew Pickens, who had marched in during the night. These Morgan ordered to deliver two deliberate fires at 50 yards and then to withdraw to a position on the left of Howard's Continentals. He also told them that in case of a charge by Tarleton's dragoons, every third man should fire and the other two hold their fire lest the cavalry continue their advance. And he exhorted them, shoot for the opulent boys. On the slope about 150 yards below Pickens, Morgan threw out an irregular line of 150 sharpshooters to act as skirmishers. The Georgians, commanded by Major John Cunningham, he sent to his left, and to his right he sent the North Carolinians, commanded by Major Charles McDowell. He told these riflemen to conceal themselves behind trees to wait until the British had advanced to within 50 yards and to shoot from rest. After one fire, they should retire and take their places in the line commanded by Pickens. Let me see, said Morgan as he rode away, which are most entitled to the credit of brave men, the boys of Carolina or those of Georgia. In the swell behind the crown of Cowpens, Morgan posted Lieutenant Colonel William Washington with 80 Continental Dragoons and Lieutenant Colonel James McCall with 45 Mounted Infantry who had been armed with swords. These were his only reserve. He had already ordered the drivers of the baggage wagon to move on towards Broad River and the horses of the militia to be tied in the woods beyond the swell. As his troops began forming, Morgan rode along their lines encouraging them. He saw that the men, as well as the officers, understood the battle plan. He cautioned each line against the alarm. The men ahead were supposed to retreat. It was part of the plan. Then, like a country politician at a rally, he cracked jokes, inquired about wives and sweethearts, and promised them as sure as he lived, the old wagoner would crack his whip over Ben Tarleton, as Morgan called Ben. I would not have had a swamp in the view of my militia on any consideration, Morgan said years later in just find his choice of a battleground. They would have made for it, and nothing could have detained them from it. And as to covering my wings, I knew my adversary, and was perfectly sure I'd have nothing but downright fighting. As a retreat, it was the very thing I wished to cut off all hope of. I would have thanked Tarleton had he surrounded me with his cavalry. It would have only been better than placing my own men in the rear to shoot those who broke from the ranks. When men are forced to fight, they will sell themselves dearly, and I knew that the dread of Tarleton's cavalry would give due weight to the protection of my bayonets and keep my troops from breaking as Buford's regiment did at Waxhaws. Had I crossed the river, one half the militia would immediately have abandoned me. When Captain Oglevy reached the foot of Cappins, he sent a messenger galloping back through the highlight of dawn with an exciting report. Morgan was forming his lines for battle. Immediately, Tarleton called in his guides and consulted them. Relative to the ground General Morgan then occupied and the country in his rear, these people described both with great perspicuity. They said that the woods were open and free from swamps, that part of Broad River, just above the place where King's Creek joined the stream, was about six miles distant from the enemy's left flank, and that the river, by making a curve to the westward, ran parallel to their rear. With an immediate grasp of the enemy's position and a supreme confidence that his British regiments could drive these militia against Broad River, Tarleton hurried his troops forward. He halted them some 400 yards from the American line. Then, that he might inspect the enemy's posture more closely, he ordered Oglevy and his dragoons to drive in the skirmishers. With a shout, the green horse charged, their sabers flashing, the hoofs of their horse pounding up the general rise. Suddenly, the rifles of the sharpshooters blazed. Dragoons screamed, cursed, fell from their horses. Shocked and demoralized, they recoiled. When the horses came back, fifteen saddles were empty. 
Tarleton decided to make a frontal assault, ordering the infantry to throw down everything, save arms and ammunition. He began arranging his line. The light infantry were then ordered to file to the right until they became equal to the flank of the American line. The Legion infantry were added to their left, and under the fire of the three-pounder, this part of the British troop was instructed to advance within 300 yards of the enemy, he wrote in the campaigns. When the grasshopper, as the royal artillerist called the little cannon sitting upon legs, started belching grape shot into the woods, the American skirmishers fled. Some 300 yards below the line of Pickens' militia, the center and the right wing of the British force paused. Here, Tarleton completed his formation. To the left of the Legion infantry, he emplaced another grasshopper. Beyond that, he deployed the 7th Regiment, commanded by Major Newmarsh. A captain with 50 dragoons was placed on each flank of the corps, who formed the British line to protect their own and threaten the flanks of the enemy, said Tarleton. The 1st Battalion of the 71st was desired to extend a little to the left of the 7th Regiment and to remain 150 yards in the rear. This body in infantry and near 200 cavalry composed a reserve. During the execution of these arrangements, the animation of the officers and the alacrity of the soldiers afforded the most promising assurance of success. They formed a colorful line. Green-coated dragoons sat their horses, sabers in hand. Red-coated light infantry, muskets at rest, bayonets fixed, formed the right. The red-coated artillerymen stood their cannon. The green-coated infantry of the British Legion formed the center. On the left stood New Marsh's Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Tarleton led the attack in person. At about 7 o'clock, he shouted a command, and the majors dressed their lines. At his command, the drums rolled, the pipes shrilled, the artillery roared. The red and green lines caught step and paraded. The green horse cantered. Several nervous recruits in the 7th started firing, but New Marsh suppressed them. And as their commander sent the campaigns, the troops moved on in as good a line as troops could move at open files. But Pig and Riflemen were marking the Appellate Boys. Coolly, those sharpshooters trumbled officers and non commissioned officers down the slope. The blended line of red and green began to sag. They quickly reformed. Then, with huzzas, they charged. Their officers shouting, Give them the bayonets! Pickett's militia retreated without squandering. Those nearest bolted for the assigned position on the left of Continentals. Those on the right, in perfect order for militiamen, began making a traverse of the quarter mile front. Instinctively, Tarleton seized the opportunity. The cavalry on the right was directed to charge the enemy's left, he later said. They executed the order with great gallantry, but were drove back by the fire of the reserve and by a charge of Colonel William Washington's cavalry. The collapse of Pickens' line seemed the beginning of the expected debacle. At about 7.15, Tarleton reformed his line and threw it against the Continentals. American bus muskets mo boomed in volley after volley, but the red and green line never faltered. Rifles crackled, epaulet men tumbled in the scrub. Said Tarleton, the fire on both sides was well supported and produced much slaughter. At about 7.30, Tarleton trotted back to his reserve and ordered MacArthur to move the 71st to the left and begin flanking the Americans. MacArthur dressed his line. As his command, the piper stepped forward and the bagpipes began to scurl. The Highlanders pivoted and started on the left oblique for the American right flank. Observing the moment, the movement of the Highlanders, Howard ordered the company on his extreme right to wheel to their left, come about, and face the flankers. Misunderstanding, they turned and marched in good order towards the rear. The rest of the Virginia and Georgia militia quickly followed. Seeing their right wing crumble, the Continentals turned and began retreating also. What is this, a retreat? Morgan thundered at Howard. A change of position to save my right flank answered Howard. Are you beaten? Do men who march like that look as though they were beaten? Right, snapped Morgan. I'll choose you a second position when you reach it, face about, and fire. Sensing victory, Tarleton tried to throw everything into the action. In the wake of the Continentals, his infantry surged. Their lines straggling and their ranks thronging in tumultuous disorder, they had become hopelessly entangled in their charge. They're coming on like a mob, Washington sent word to Morgan. Give them one fire and I'll charge them. Morgan received Washington's message just as he reached his new position. To Howard he shouted, face about, give them one fire and the day is ours. At about 7.45 the Continentals came about and loosened a withering gunfire straight from the hip. 
The red and green staggered. The dead and wounded cumbered the ground. At that moment, Howard yelled, Give them the bayonet. And to the disorganized British troops charged the steady ranks in buckskin. In all battles, a moment occurs when the bravest troops, after having made the greatest efforts, feel inclined to run. Once observed, Napoleon. To this truth, the Green Dragoon bore vivid testimony. An unaccountable panic extended itself along the whole line. The recruits prostrated themselves on the ground and bellowed for quarter. Tarleton's quarter rang the reply, but Daniel Morgan was not a butcher. Howard checked his men and shouted, Throw down your arms and we'll give you good quarter. Instead of surrendering, the light infantry and the British Legion infantry ran towards the road leading back to the Pacolet. Seeing his center give way, Tarleton strode valiantly to rally his infantry. At the same time, he sent an order for his reserve dragoons to go to the support of MacArthur. The cavalry did not comply with the order, and the effort to collect the infantry was ineffectual. Neither promises nor threats could gain their attention, he said. At about 7.50, Washington's dragoon charged among the British foot soldiers. Some 200 yards from the battle front, they corralled the leaders and routed them up like stampeding cattle. During the melee, the horse, the green horse, had not budged. Tarleton now galloped to bring them to the charge. Pickering's sharpshooters guessed his identity and opened with their rifles. He rode on, his life still charmed, but not that of his charger. Suddenly, the beast collapsed. Bannister sprang up, sword in hand. He had heard the shouts of Tarleton's quarter. At that moment, Dr. Robert Jackson, assistant surgeon of the 71st Regiment, rode up and offered his horse to Tarleton. The colonel refused to take another means of safety, but Jackson insisted, exclaiming, Your safety is of the highest importance to the enemy. I mean, to the army, sorry. Dr. Jackson whipped out his handkerchief, fastened it to the end of his cane, and with the jauntiness of an interne, strolling along the rotten row, headed for the Americans. To their challenge, he answered, I am assistant surgeon to the 71st Regiment. Many of the men are wounded and in your hands. I therefore come to offer my services to attend them. On the left, MacArthur and his Highlanders still fought valiantly against them. Pickens now threw his reformed militia, and a gallant battalion slowly began retreating. Howard wheeled his disciplined Continentals on their flank into the Scottish center, charged Colonel James Jackson at the head of his Georgians. He marched at their regimental flag, but missed. Howard promised corner and locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but hopelessly surrounded the Highlanders, grounded their arms. Major MacArthur stepped forward and presented his sword to Colonel Pickens. The Highlanders had paid the toll of gallantry and blood and death. Of their 16 officers, 9 lay dead or wounded, and among the wounded, swearing vengeance upon the Green Dragoon, lay Lieutenant Roderick Mackenzie. He would never let Tarleton forget this day. In the meantime, Tarleton, riding Jackson's horse, was trying to bring into action the reserve of the British Legion. The weight of such an attack might yet retrieve the day, the enemy being much broken by their late, rapid advance, he said in the campaigns, but all attempts to restore order, recollection, or courage proved fruitless. About 200 dragoons forsook their leader and left the field of battle. But, proudly he added, 14 officers and 40 horsemen were, however, not unmindful of their own reputation or the situation of their commanding officer. The royal artillerists still fought their guns. Round after round, they hurled at the victors. Captain Anderson and Captain Kirkwood selected a gun each, and with their Continentals, rushed it with the bayonet. Seeing their assault, Tarleton charged with his 54 loyal dragoons, but the Americans seized the cannon, and he signaled a retreat. The American dragoons now charged the recruiting Green Horse. Some, three, some 30 yards ahead of his troops rode Washington. Tarleton and his horsemen turned back in defiance. Washington slashed at the officer on Tarleton's right, but his sword broke near the hilt. The Britisher rose in his stirrups for the coup de gare, but a lad named Collins rode past and dropped his sword arm with a pistol ball through the shoulder. At the moment, the officer on Tarleton's left cut at Washington, but the blow was deflected by Sergeant Major Peary. The Green Dragoon charged, his enormous saber raised. Washington parried the slash with his broken sword, reining his charger in a circle. Tarleton snatched his pistol and fired. The ball missed Washington, but wounded his horse. Having fired the last shot at Calvin's, Bannister Tarleton after, galloped after his fleeing green horse. So this was the Battle of Calvin's from both sides, a bit of a perspective of both. It was kind of a disaster for the British um, I definitely, Tarleton, if you go back and look at his kind of training into the war, he didn't have much military training. A lot of the 
stuff he learned about how to command an army was really learned on the fly, and he was not ready for a large command that Cornwallis gave him. He was better at not really partisan activities, but operating with just dragoons and a few light infantry, maybe a piece of artillery, but not a command of maybe 1,500 or 2,000 men. I think his, if you look at Waxhaws, he had uh, fewer troops, and he performed a little bit better. If you look at the rest of his Revolutionary War service, he was better with fewer troops, not when it came to full-on field, uh, line-to-line combat. Now, Daniel Morgan, he's a military genius. I love studying his tactics, and I was always very impressed at how when things during the Battle of Cowpens, they seemed to be falling, like when the militia mistook the order and they started retreating, he was able to take a potentially back-breaking situation and turn it into a victory. It was that last volley that really broke the British Army. And, you know, if he had kind of panicked and was like, oh, what do I do, what do I do, who knows what would have happened, especially if Tarleton would have gotten his dragoons, um, going after the retreating troops a lot earlier, there would have been no way that Morgan would have been able to reform his lines, especially since when it came to cavalry, the British had the Americans outnumbered that day. It's just at the end of the day, Morgan was a better tactician, a better strategist than Tarleton was, and Tarleton could probably ever hope to be. And of course, the Georgians and North Carolinians, they were amazing during this battle, and Pickens, I have to give him a lot of credit when it came to motivating his troops but this was, I hope you all enjoyed the different look into the Battle of Cowpens. Once again, the book I just read to you was The Green Dragoon, written by Robert D. Bass. It's probably the best book I have ever read on the American Revolutionary War, and it's one of my favorite books in my collection. If you ever get a chance, uh, you see it at your local library, you see it at a store, I highly advise you pick it up. It's definitely worth it. It's a really interesting read into not just the American Revolutionary War, especially Tarleton, but to also how life was at that time, the 18th century in England and colonial America. So I hope you all enjoy this video. Leave your thoughts, comments, questions below. I will reply to all of them. And don't forget to subscribe for more content. And have a good day, everyone.